Hello, and welcome to This is USG, a video podcast by the universities at Shady Grove. Nine universities, one campus, great results. I'm Ann Kadimian, Executive Director of USG. Higher education is facing many challenges. Access, affordability, the inclusivity of campuses, a rapidly transforming economy and job market, the connections of universities to communities, and the role of universities in tackling the massive problems of our times. The pandemic has highlighted many of these challenges as well, and is testing the resilience and innovation of universities across the country to respond and to lead. Tonight, it is an honor to welcome Dr. Daryl Pines, the new president of the University of Maryland at College Park to This Is USG. At the core of his bold vision for UMD is a challenge to reinvent the public research university of the future to take on many of these challenges. We will learn more about this challenge and the ways in which President Pines is leading to help transform higher education today. President Pines, welcome to This Is USG. Thank you, Anne. Look forward to speaking with you. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, Daryl, if I may, could you tell us a little bit about your path here? You, you went to the University of California, Berkeley. You went to MIT, some of the most prestigious universities in the country, studied mechanical engineering, um, you know, worked on some of the most sophisticated projects um, in aerospace engineering. How, how did you find your pathway to the presidency? Tell us a little bit about that history. Well, thank you. Um, I, I'm proud to be the 34th president of the University of Maryland College Park. You know, I started uh, very similar to you on July 1st of last year, and it has really been an honor to, to serve in this position thus far and to deepen my connections with the university and to help expand our mission and our footprint to impact the world in a positive way. So I've been a part of the University of Maryland community for about 26 years, um, arriving, as a, arriving as a young assistant professor moved on to department chair, and later to becoming dean of the A. James Clark School of Engineering. My wife, Sylvia, and I have had two children who also love the university very dearly. They both have come to this institution and both have secured their uh, academic uh, careers by coming to University of Maryland. And we have basically are just a Turp family. My background is, you know, I grew up in a working class home in East Oakland, California which was a majority Black and Hispanic, uh, relatively impoverished part of the San Francisco Bay Area, where opportunities were scarce. Um, and the term university president was not in the vocabulary at the time. Uh, my parents didn't have a chance to have a higher education experience like I did. They uh, had high school uh, education and maybe a little bit of community college. But they instilled a sense of um, commitment to education as the great equalizer to all three of their children. So I went, I was fortunate, went to a top college uh, near my home, kind of like University of Maryland is to many Marylanders. I went to UC California, uh, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and I recognized that I had that opportunity because someone was fortunate enough to provide me a need-based scholarship so I didn't have to work and I could attend. And later I would uh, receive all additional merit-based scholarships to, to attend the university. From there, I was fortunate to have done well in mechanical engineering and head on to graduate school at um, MIT and pursue a master's and PhD, also in mechanical and aerospace engineering. So um, sitting here today, I really want students who are just like me, come from some arbitrary zip code in the United States, and in this case, the state of Maryland, um, to have access, affordability, and attainment um, for themselves from any um, jurisdiction, any background, any zip code to come to the flagship campus and to earn their degree and launch their own journey like I did 30 plus years ago. Yeah, that's, that's a great, um, great journey and wonderful story. And we're so fortunate to have you here as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you know, in, a lot of your initiatives, and we'll talk a minute about kind of reinventing the public research university, but you know, you, you've, you've set out some really bold, important challenges uh, to tackle, including systemic racism, including responding positively to the pandemic. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of challenges that you've put out to all of the community to really take hold of. 
I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your leadership philosophy and how you go about pursuing these things, because you, you've hinted to some of it, which is the deep commitment that everyone should have this opportunity. Everyone should have an opportunity to pursue their dreams. Education is the great equalizer. Could you say a little bit more about how that informs your leadership philosophy, how you how you're steering and leading and how you you know, what, what is your philosophy for bringing about the changes you want to bring about um, at UMD and in higher education more generally? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I believe, you know, all of us who are living have gone through something so traumatic that we've never experienced in our lives before. So it comes from the perspective of first focus on our common humanity. The world has been faced with something it hasn't seen over a hundred years and in most people's lifetime they've never seen. Then added on top of that, you know, you have one pandemic of the virus and then you have another pandemic of racial injustice and social unrest. Then you have a third pandemic of the uncertainty in our whole democratic process being challenged. So 2020 will go down in history as a incredible seminal year in the history of humanity. So when you look at it from that perspective, then you realize that for the first time, people, some people are realizing that we are commonly connected. One may say we're connected by the virus. Others, we are connected by social um, causes. So when you look at the world through those lens, that kind of a lens, you realize that the university must lead the way out of the situation, both from a scientific perspective to actually combat the virus, but also from a vision about what's a better place that we could be at as a community and can we lead first at the university then in within to the community and then hopefully within the nation so that's kind of how i looked at it when i started on july 1st of 2020. i had probably had a different different vision that i was envisioning um, before the pandemic and before the multiple pandemics but i realized what was critical was to say, what is the mission of the university in this critical time period in our history on, of society and of the human race? And this experiment, which we call America, has been working towards a better place for 400 plus years. And I felt it was important that I signal to the community that I had two really high priorities. One is what you would expect a university president to say is that we should be excellent in everything that we do. And I really mean that in everything that we do from obviously teaching and learning, to innovation and entrepreneurship, to the arts, to research, and of course, to um, just general academic excellence, and of course, athletics as well. Um, and number two, I thought that based on the times that we were living in, that it was important to focus on creating a more inclusive and multicultural community where every person from any zip code, from any walk of life could reach their full potential. And that is how I started July 1st with that announcement. And then I listed 12 um, objectives and goals to achieve um, that I felt were important at that time. I had actually 20 something, but I said 12 was enough to get started on. And, um, and they turned out they were some of the right ones to, to, to do. And I bracketed them in sort of three broad categories. One was improving the student experience. Two was um, creating a more inclusive uh, community. And three was advancing the mission of the university. And that's where those 12 um, sort of objectives are bracketed. Let me just highlight a couple of them for you and, and sort of where I was coming from. At universities, we tend to bring students here and faculty and staff, and we often don't really have a way to sort of share with them that these are our expectations in our community. This is our values that we respect one another, that we treat each other with respect, um, and that we actually work together as a really cohesive community and they win every voice to be heard. And in so doing, I wanted to create this sort of onboarding experience that had never been created for me, but hadn't been created for anyone, generally across our university. So I came up with this concept, which was called Terrapin Strong, and it wasn't just a trademark on a, on a mask. Um, yes, it was on our mask, but it was really a message of solidarity, of inclusivity and inclusive excellence. And that we, University of Maryland College Park, would be like no other university. We would onboard everyone to our culture, to our values, to what we really want people 
to do and interact with one another in a very respectful way. How can we educate them about anti-racism? How can we educate them about gender differences, about religious differences? So I took this Terrapin Strong of solidarity and inclusivity and tried to make it a way in which we would onboard individuals in a very inclusive way, giving everyone a voice and saying, this is what we expect, how you treat one another. And sort of that was the genesis of a whole, um, so sort of, I would say, um, revolution in the sense of a cultural change of our university that would start with the first day onboarding. Then it would go into education. Then it would go into faculty and staff interactions. And then now, you know, we are now applying this across the entire enterprise. And so um, um, it's essentially a way to say we can be a better community and now we can rep reflect where we want the values of the nation to go as well. And so that's kind of how it started. And, um, and so far, um, it has been embraced across the university and people are found now um, taking ownership of their own colleges, their units, and how they can treat people with respect. Um, and also it leads to a whole modality of let's be more diverse. Let's go, let's really give access and affordability to students. So this past year, um, for example, we have the largest applications, number of applications in the history of the University of Maryland by 17,000. We've now passed, we used to get a roughly around 32,000, 34,000 applications every year. We're now over 50,000, um, partly because like many universities went test optional, but we also got into a common app system we had never been in. And so we have actually the most diverse applicant pool in history and therefore the most diverse applicant pool and admitted pool as well. So we hope that the fall will be radically different for our campus in terms of giving access and affordability and options to folks from a variety of backgrounds. And, and I might really premise here is that I believe um, the flagship university of the state of Maryland must stand up and lead in these challenging times across all of these areas, including the scientific areas. And not only should it lead, it should focus on the grand challenges of our time, the pandemic, climate change, famine, poverty, democracy, election, voting, um, and then be ultimately a catalyst for change and a catalyst for economic development. So I'll, I'll stop there, yeah. but that's no, how that's, I see it. That's, that's fantastic. So what I'm hearing in your leadership philosophy, I'm hearing, a deep embrace of values that are really important and and really emphasizing those the implementation of those values and using this onboarding experience as a way to really implement those values and to practice them in a very direct kind of way um, i agree i think that that culture emerges from practice right it's signaling and it's practice and it's how it's reinforced and then it takes on its own momentum as well so it's so exciting to hear you say that it's starting to lead to more ways of thinking about greater diversity and more inclusivity and it has it has kind of a its own momentum um, i wonder building on this idea of leadership and the onboarding experience um, I've, I've listened to one of your classes um, that, that you teach around the grand challenges. I listened to the, um, the focus on the, the pediatrician who mm -hmm. she was leading the, the Flint, Michigan effort to protect children from lead poisoning. And um, it was just a fascinating conversation, really, really interesting. And, you know, but what I saw in there was you kind of taking leadership to the next level and in, in the sense of saying all of you young people you know you've got a, you've got a responsibility when you leave this university and kind of like a, a charge for public service leadership and am, am i am i reading too much into that or how are you thinking no about you're that absolutely fact? reading everything into it you're absolutely dead on i i i believe that you know so we're, we're really you know it, folks um, may look at this world that we live in today and say oh it's terrible to be in a leadership position today. And, um, and I would argue it's incredible to be in a leadership position because the crisis is right in front of everyone's faces more than if it was a better time period. You know, so the pandemic is in your face every day. Social unrest for some groups are, is in their face literally every day. And so what it's enabled me to do when I, again, that was another major thing. I'm, I'm glad you are recognizing it that the strategy was, okay, we're in this cir circumstance. Um, 
I call it the grand challenges of our time. What are they? Let's articulate them. But more importantly, I have a chance to inspire a whole nother generation of leaders like the pediatrician who took it upon our own initi initiative to solve the Flint water problem, which was lead in the water because her patients had a high level of lead in their blood. And she was trying to figure this out. So I would bring these speakers to my class and say, look at this average person, not really completely average, you know, she is a medical doctor and a pediatrician. Um, and however, she was inspired by a problem and she wanted to see a solution on her patient. And she wasn't making any headway until she had to really get into the details of this problem. And so what I was saying to them is that basically all of us have a passion for something. All of us have a concern about something. So here's an average person who has decided that she's going to make this her life, a portion of her life's work and make a difference in the lives of thousands of people, maybe tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people. And I wanted to show them how it started by having these great speakers come and have them meet them, ask them questions, but most importantly, to inspire them to think, what could they do as future leaders? No one's asking them to do something at age 18 today, but think about how they see the world and how they learn their, develop their skills over the next several years at the university and really advance their ability to be visionary, to go after these grand challenges of our time and actually solve them, right? And so part of, um, I believe, leadership is trying to uh, and really grow the next generation of leaders. So almost providing them with various roadmaps by which they can pursue their own careers. So that was the impetus of that course. And I'm super excited because I'm going to do it again in the fall. And I'm already working on some of the big topics that we're working on. Um, and, you know, one of them that we had this past fall was also on the, the, the sort of criminal injustice and the criminal justice system, which also has its own challenges. And we had a couple of speakers along those threads. So I just think it's an opportunity. The time has presented uh, an opportunity that in these very stressful times that people can really acutely see these issues now. For example, the... Um, the inequities in the health system. They are never been more apparent than they are because of the virus. Still, we have folks who haven't been vaccinated living in certain communities in the state of Maryland. This is really kind of unacceptable, but it showed uh, the optics have put a particular acute lens on certain communities that the inequities were systematically there and only have been more exacerbated with the virus. And I think this is another opportunity for our students to do public service to help improve the situation going forward. And I agree with you, this is a job that you and I should be doing to inspire our students as we go forward, that public service on behalf of the public good is a very noble thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned the crisis of democracy earlier in your comments as well. And I think by showing students the possibilities of their leadership, you know, they don't have to be, they don't have to be, you know, great heroes. They just have to stand up for what they believe in and they have to use their knowledge to tackle problems, you know? And, and I think that, that that message is so powerful and it's just a powerful message of being a good citizen as well. Um, you know, what, I, what I'm really intrigued about with this class on grand challenges is that you're starting with students. You know, many universities are taking on grand challenges, but they start, they start outward and they start with research. You know, you're starting with the students, and that's really fascinating. I think that that's, I think it's going to be very impactful, and I think it gives the grand challenges more meaning and more context and more traction, if you will, because it's, it's you know the young people and it's their future and what they're they're taking out as well. Uh, you know, listening to some of your your early um, speeches and some of your early comments on before you before you took the the helm uh, at UMD. You, you talked about the need to reinvent the public research university and to really rethink it. And, you know, UMD is also a very famous land grant university as well. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you mean by that. What, what does it mean to reinvent the university? What does it look like? Is it around innovation? Is it the, the mission? How, how do you see that reinvention? Yeah, great question again. I mean, in the, you know, again, as I see it is the out of crisis comes opportunity. 
And um, so never before has higher education been hit in every one of its revenue streams negatively at the same time. I don't think it has ever happened in the history of higher education. Maybe there's another time, but of course not within the last hundred years that I'm aware of. Um, but every revenue stream has been hit in a negative way. And that's because the state didn't have sufficient revenue because of a loss of tax base. Um, we don't have as many students physically on campus and our campuses are residential uh, primarily. Um, and so our auxiliaries are hurt. We can't play sports because of the virus in the same way and have fans in the stadiums and so forth. So every revenue stream that we had had been really hit. So again, with the crisis comes opportunity to look at it through different glasses and through a different prism. And so over this entire year now, we've had some experimentation that we've been able to do to kind of sort of think about, gee, you know, we have this wonderful student experience in this wonderful residential environment, but how can we, in this environment of the crisis, make, make ourselves more resilient? That's really the word I always use. And then more innovative because of it, not, not against it, but because of it. And so, um, so, you know, several things have emerged which are really exciting that help us understand that the future may exactly not be like the fall of 2019, that the fall of 22 may be totally different than the fall of 2019 and the fall of 2025 may still be evolving. And so um, I would argue that's definitely true. We've learned a lot in the virtual environment and we learned how to do things um, effectively and efficiently to carry out a business. But for, I'll give you several examples of the reimagination of, of university life in different sectors that I think will enable excellence to go forward and a sort of a new model for the university to go forward. So for example, uh, I, I wasn't able to, to travel um, uh, like you. I was not able to travel very much because of the virus. So how could I connect with our alumni base in an effective and efficient way? Well, I have probably been able to connect with over 10,000 alums. I would have never been able to do that in person. Never been able to do that in person, you know? But because of technology and because of isolation, our alums are just as, you know, vibrant as they were if they were in person, and they actually even want more connectivity because they're isolated. So it turns out, and uh, you know, that we've been able to connect up with tens of thousands of alums by webinar, by virtual um, uh, engagements and receptions, and, you know, on our giving day, we had the largest giving day in history because people were isolated and they wanted to give back to the university and feel that the university was in trouble. So again, a combination of the technology and the crisis leads to opportunity to even engage more. That's one example. Another example is, as, as it is at USG, is that many of our employees, because of their work-life balance issues, you know, really uh, can effectively work from home and actually need to work from home because they have elder care or child care issues that they have to deal with and have to balance, again, the work and the life. And so we have obviously discovered, like you have, that, um, wow, maybe we don't need to have 30% of the workforce even come back. If we can make their home environment more effective, more efficient for them to carry out their jobs. So again, reimagining work has happened in this uh, modality that we're in. And then similarly, we've been able to, to conduct research. We've been able to automate some systems that we had never even thought about automating. Digital systems of communication of paperwork and, and decision making. Um, automated laboratories that we never decided to automate before, but now because we're remote, we could do that and put, put some technology in there and now run our experiments without anybody being even in the laboratory environment. So again, another innovation that came out of the uh, crisis, but leads to an opportunity and has actually accelerated and increased our research um, footprint, um, you know, with, with, you know, unexpectedly. So I would say there's a number of things where we are now looking strategically now. Uh, so we just started our strategic planning process that we're going to launch next uh, week. And, uh, and the hope is to look at our administration and operation, look at our academic affairs, look at our student affairs, and in those nuggets, figure out what the new model might be and experiment and hopefully give students even greater um, student experiences that are better and also make our operations more efficient and maybe even save money um, going forward and then generate additional research impact. So super excited about this new um, way of thinking 
that is a result of the crisis that we're both living through. It's amazing how, you know, the structures and the assumptions and things that, that shape what we're doing, we can't see past that. And then a crisis just changes everything. It really Absolutely. loosens everything and changes it all. So, yeah. well, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, you know, as dean of the Clark School, you were a real innovator with USG, and and that the uh, programs coming from College Park to USG and that are here are just really exciting, and so so many um, new things on the horizon, and so many well established programs here as well. In fact, earlier today, I did a I had a call with a, one of the bioscience students. They have their new bioscience blog, their biosci blog. And it was just wonderful. Katie Garcia, she just did a fantastic job. But just a, a wonderful representation of you know the students coming from College Park and so focused and on you know solving problems and getting out there in the world and taking on big things. Um, what do, what do you see the relationship? Um, how do you see the relationship between USG? and College Park growing. You know, all these exciting, innovative programs are very multidisciplinary. Um, they're filling the new biosciences engineering building. Uh, you know, we see ourselves as really positioned to, to help really directly, especially in the life sciences corridor in particular, but, you know, all kinds of disciplines in that area. So we've got some real exciting ideas, but all of those are only possible with our strong partnerships with our academic partners. So how, how are you envisioning USG in your thinking about the future of College Park? Yeah, so, and we, we are in, I think, violent agreement with you that um, in partnership with USG, we look at the same strategic areas that you look at, look at in Montgomery County, that life sciences is a strain. Um, information technology is a strain. Um, so when we looked at that and I was Dean of Engineering, we said, you know, let's not duplicate anything we do at College Park. Let's give USG uniqueness that gives it a desire and a demand signal that students want to come to USG, you know, whether they're coming from Montgomery College or they're coming from another two-year institution in, in or outside the state, that they want to come for this particular training and degree program. So we decided to make sure that our programming, our academic programming, was extremely unique at USG. So we decided to put mechatronics there. We want to put embedded systems and Internet of Things there. That's something we don't offer at the main campus. Um, and also computational biotechnology area that we also put at USG because of the life sciences area. So we think when we did our own analysis, that those would be a heavy draw, of course, from Montgomery College, but maybe from other parts of the state where students would want to come and not only get a degree at USG, but stay in the region and work for many of the options that are in the region. So that's how we thought about it. And that's how a number of programs here at College Park think about. Mm -hmm. Then the other intangible is because USG is co-located with IBBR, there's an opportunity to do uh, specialized research in the lab and do some internships. Probably something that hasn't really been thought about deeply, but again, it, it's in the life sciences. And most of the work that goes on there is in the life sciences. And um, we have work that's on vaccine development, right? We have work that's on structural biology that's going on and research there. So it's a great opportunity in partnership with USG, College Park, and of course, the research enterprise as well. And so we see that as a win win for the whole community. And of course, the partnership with the local. Uh, government entities and uh, businesses that are in Montgomery uh, County, maybe a few of those that are in Frederick County as well, uh, in terms of the life sciences as a way to grow the opportunities, grow the workforce for the region, and really leverage its unique location, which is USG in Rockville. So that's how we looked at it in engineering. That's how I look at it as a president. Um, I feel that we should only do unique programming at USG that gives it a, a sense of place, a sense of uniqueness, and also a skill set that maybe uh, the, even the main campus doesn't have, but students coming out of it would have. And the fortunate part is that we've got a wonderful partner in Montgomery College, and uh, it produces high quality students that transfer in relatively seamlessly and can get these kinds of degrees in many of the broader STEM disciplines. So, yeah, and that's really exciting. And, you know, I've I haven't had a chance to meet many students face to face because of the pandemic, but I do try to meet with students regularly. And 
you know, it's just so exciting to hear students who are living in Montgomery County and for a variety of circumstances might not have been able to go to college had it not been for an opportunity at USG, right. um, but to get their degree from, yeah. you know, College Park or from one of, one of our other partners is really, uh, really exciting. And the students coming to USG are uh, so motivated, so motivated to get out there and to tackle the, the big challenges of the world as well. Very similar to the students that you're, you're teaching in your Grand Challenges courses and things as well. So Absolutely. that's, um, yeah, that, no, that's. I also think what helps you is that, you know, what has grown up for all of us is USG um, with the several buildings and the wonderful new biomedical uh, building and engineering building. Um, but even the whole complex has grown. I've watched it grown over the last decade. So I think it just gives it a sense of place, excitement to be in the facility, to be in the laboratories, the new facilities. I think it makes it exciting for students who want to um, get their degrees there. So yeah, no, it's it's very exciting. You know, you mentioned the partnership with Montgomery College, and um, you know, we're we're thinking about this kind of whole pathway coming in, so that you know, how do you ensure that students are coming from K through 12 and through Montgomery College, and they're ready to take on embedded systems and the internet of things, or they're ready, ready to take on biocomputation. Sure. And so we've been thinking a lot here about that whole pathway and how we strengthen that pathway and what role do we in higher education play in that pathway as well. And I think there's a lot we can do in this space to really address the gaps between them and to give students more information and more support early on so that they're thinking about a college future all the way through. Not every child comes from a home where people are thinking about higher education and things right. as well. I wonder, how, does, how, how do you think about the role of College Park or the role of higher education more generally in terms of this broader ecosystem, this broader um, you know, set of partners in the, in the whole educational enterprise, and, and not only coming up to college, but thinking about it in kind of adaptive lifelong learning, you know, that there's, it, our learning doesn't end when we get our college degree or our master's, or, you know, that there's always point of need learning as well. Is that, is that piece of that kind of broader ecosystem, is that something that you're taking into consideration as you're thinking about reinventing the university and some of the access and affordability challenges as well. Absolutely. I mean, I was very fortunate and that I, when I first became president, um, the county executive of Prince George's County, uh, uh, chief of staff, uh, Joy Russell, um, called me. I didn't know her at all. I didn't know the county executive, Alsa Brooks, Angela Alsa Brooks. Um, and they called me up and they said, are you the president of College Park? I said, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> they said, we want you to chair the Prince George's County COVID Task Force Subcommittee on Education Recovery starting on the next Monday. I said, I've just started the job. Like it was the second day on the job. And I said, I said um, you know, I don't know the county executive. They said, Dad, you don't need to know the county. So anyway, long story short, I chair the subcommittee. And it's everything that you just um, asked in the question. It, it essentially was a subcommittee to look at the entire ecosystem pre-K to 20 of the Prince George's County Educational Enterprise to see how, first of all, could we um, operate within the COVID conditions in the most effective way. That was sort of, we call that the sort of short-term um, solution to get the county and the school system operational. Then there was the second level, which was sort of the near term within the next two or three years. What do you think the county needs to do to be more effective in creating pathways to opportunity? And then finally was like the long five, 10 year strategic. Um, what does the county need to do to invest in now to produce the types of graduates that we want staying in the county and going into the workforce? And so that's kind of what we did over, and we just literally concluded literally two weeks ago, uh, you know, tired, so I've been on this thing, been thing for literally all this time. Yeah. And basically, um, some of the key elements that came out that would be relevant to Montgomery County as well um, were these linkages between high school, that is the entire high school system, K-12 um, high school system, into junior college, into four-year institutions. And one of the challenges that we saw was, um, and, uh, was that the universities, you know, I'll give you one simple thing that probably is a big issue that needs to get resolved in the state, is um, making sure that courses 
are labeled the same if they're in Prince George's Community College or Montgomery College, and they're at Bowie State or College Park or UMBC or wherever it may be. Uh, that is, uh, calculus 141 is the same calculus as 141 at Prince George's County as it is at College Park, right? And, and so that simple thing, which needs to go through a full review, which would take probably a few years to do, would allow for seamless interaction and understanding of articulation because you were using all the same course number codes. Just a simple thing as that. Yeah. That was number one. Number two, that the universities have these incredible body of very smart people, which are students, and that they can serve a service to the county by just simply being available to high school students as mentors. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do a little bit of that in the fall of 2020 through the virtual environment again. So that we can get on, so one you know, college kid can get on and talk to 10 high school kids. And that was really cool because yeah. they were closer to their in age and they could just provide support. So, you know, we would have never thought about that if we were not in a virtual environment again, right? It's just amazing how these little things that, oh, I never thought we've never done that, but now we can do it. So, so the impediment used to be, I can't go to the high school, but I don't need to go to the high school. I can mm -hmm. just schedule a webinar with you, right? And so, um, so now that's available. And then the other final uh, sort of bigger part was the um, digital divide, closing the digital divide uh, in Montgomery County or Prince George's County. There are many schools that didn't have enough devices. There are many schools that had, um, where, depending on where they were, rural, suburban, or urban, had a drop in the, in the broadband service. Yeah. Um, that's true in Montgomery County, it's true in Prince George's County. So these are the long-term issues that need to be resolved. But there were many really cool ideas that came out um, that were about the ecosystem and making it a bit more efficient and how to take a student and enable them to get the skills that they needed to go into the workforce of the future for that county or for the state of Maryland. So. Yeah. I, so I'm hearing, in terms of your bigger vision, I'm hearing this kind of thinking about in a much more integral kind of way, the role of the university in the community with all these connection points. And, and I think that's something that's so powerful, especially for land grant universities, Absolutely. you know, this kind of connectivity to community. And um, just the fact that you took a call on the second day and you said, okay, sure, I'll chair that subcommittee. You know, that's a, that's a wonderful signal, right? About your, about how you see the community, the, the kind of ivory tower existence is just, not working you know like <laughs> we've got well, we've got it we've got to be more connected you know well and, and i had heard all these stories that um honestly that prince george's people were telling me we don't care about them you're in a county we don't care about them so i was fortunate that i had been here all those years hearing these stories and i wanted to show no we really do care right and i'll, I'll give you one really um really cool example so um prince george's county ceo of public schools uh dr monica Golson, she calls me one day and says we need help in math just before the semester starts uh, it's like mid-August, and so we end up delivering free to the county, to 10 high schools, our calculus, introductory calculus class online with tutorial support to 10 high schools and about 70 students, roughly. Wow. Um, and that's because she felt that her delivery um, and, her, and the quality of the instruction that was on the virtual for that particular class was not where she wanted to be at every high school. So she needed some help, and we said, we'll do it. And it didn't take us much to do that. We talked to the math department chair and a couple of faculty, and they were willing to do it. So it's something where, you know, here's the partnership, and, and here's where we fit into the county and where we can help. And it's useful for the students, and it's useful for the county, and it's useful for us, because hopefully some of these, a few of these students will come to College Park, right? So, um, so it was worthy and noble to do, but most importantly, because there was a partnership, there was communication, and we are a part of the fabric of the county. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to, I'm going to pull us to one last question, if I can keep you for just a little bit longer, sure. and that is, um, you know, we've all talked a little bit about, um, you know, the crisis in democracy in this country, and you're right that, you know, this past year, challenges to elections, access, you know, um, concerns about, you know, the, the, you know, the untruths about, uh, about uh, the election outcome and, of course, the attack on the Capitol as well. And, you know, a, a number of us were all thinking about, so what, what is the role we play in all of this? You know, we're higher education institutions. We don't, we don't take teams in a sense that we don't, you know, but, but we are places of, you know, where thought needs to be exchanged freely, where people need to respect each other, where there needs to, you know, people need to develop their own ideas, their own ability to be critical thinkers. And, 
you know, um, what are your thoughts on higher education leaning into this in a more explicit way? And, you know, is it, I think we, we do some of this work all the time constantly, but what are your thoughts on a more explicit leaning into this? And what, what does it mean for how we educate and for the future of higher education more generally? I think, you know, the two are so connected, but I think we've been hesitant over the years to, to embrace this role more explicitly. And I'm just wondering what your closing thoughts might be on that. Yeah, I think it's another great area and great question. Um, I think um, for some reason it appears that I know maybe in the United States and maybe just the state of Maryland that um, teaching civics has not been done or accomplished mm -hmm. um, to give students an understanding of how the whole political process works and how they need to understand, first of all, the laws of the country. That's number one. Number two, how the country is founded and its amendments and what our freedoms are. That's, I think, the first thing that we need to educate our students on. And then secondly, I think we need to tell them we want you to play a role in the process of governance, whether that governance is at the local level, uh, city council, uh, school system, um, or bigger at the state level as a delegate. So, um, so we need to be a bit more uh, intentional about teaching civics and civic engagement. And so kind of like what you and I talked about earlier about public service. Public service is one part of what we think our students should know, but the other part now has emerged as civic engagement and civic knowledge, period. So we've just launched recently through the School of Public Policy a civics engagement center. And the concept is that any student, not just students that are in public policy, can learn about the civic process, about those laws that I spoke about and our freedoms, and then also learn about how to engage in the uh, local and governance of our country at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level. And um, and I think we have to be intentional about educating our students. And then just one small element of that is the simple right to vote and telling our students that you all should participate in the voting process. We're not telling you who to vote for. We're simply saying that you should vote and participate. So to help encourage that, you know, in these very difficult times, even during COVID, you know, any institution can become a polling site by getting, you know, ahead of the game and, and requesting to be a polling site. So we did that to make it easier, not only for our community to vote, but also to help teach lessons to our students and let them become volunteers and truly under work in the enterprise of the voting process, right? So part of that is what universities and USG should do um, because that's intentional of really having the actual experiences that our students can have right there in real time. Now, fortunately, we were in a election year, so you could do that, you can't do that every year. So every couple of years, you probably can do it. So, um, but I think you need to be intentional with this level of education so that the ignorance doesn't set in and that people, um, and, and we have to do that. If we can't do that in higher education because the rest of the community may not be doing that, but we can surely do that in higher education and almost make it a requirement of our students. And then finally, if we can also take that modality of civic engagement and civic learning and then expound it to the community and help them as well, then we're doing our job. Then we are really making a difference, I think, in having people have a voice and participate in the governance process of our country. So. Yeah. So when I when I hear your vision, you know, I see this effort to not just put conversations in silos, but to bring the conversation of democracy, to bring the conversation of responsibility, to bring the conversation of of discrimination and breaking down social, you know, in bringing social justice. You bring these conversations to every aspect of the university life. And so students are experiencing that no matter whether they're a student athlete or they're an engineering student or a student at USG. Um, and that's, that I think is such a hallmark of what you're doing here. And it's, it's really remarkable and really impressive and can't wait to see how it grows and, and, uh, and changes. So, President Pines, thank you so much. This was a wonderful conversation. It's an honor to talk with you. And we can't wait to welcome you to USG um, to you know, be on the campus. And again, I know you've been here many times, but can't wait to um, once COVID is over. So thank you so much.
Well, thank you. And thank you for you taking the position as well. We are grateful to have you and we know you're going to do great things. So it's a pleasure to be with you today, but I know I'll be working with you going forward in the future. Thank you so much.